Thank you, Jim. Just in case you need this. So you may not know that last Sunday, Andy turned 40. <laughs> so he, might, he might benefit. Touche. Uh, well, good morning. Why don't you take out your Bibles and open to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Thank you very much. And you can take out your sermon notes if you're going to use those. <clears throat> Almost 100 years uh, before William Tyndale had translated the uh, original languages, the Greek and Hebrew, into English and had a, a widely distributed scripture, uh, another Protestant reformer named John Wycliffe had also done a translation. Uh, but he did it from the Latin, and he had translated the Latin into English. I feel like I'm a little hot. Am I a little... And I mean the microphone. Is that... <clears throat> but he had translated the, the Bible from Latin into English, and uh, that gave him the title or earned him the title of heretic. So another Protestant reformer there. But during that time, when Wycliffe was living, uh, medieval soldiers, and it would have been the same in Tyndale's time, medieval soldiers and political leaders, uh, like the king and like the Catholic pope, uh, they would parade in public on large, expensive horses, really large horses, and usually white in order to distinguish from the others. And it was a way to physically and, and visibly stand out and demonstrate their authority and their power. Because if you think about it, from that high position, they could then look down on all of the uh, common unwashed masses. And so that was their way of, of showing their power. And sometime around the year 1380, uh, John Wycliffe wrote about what he saw. And this is what he wrote. Ye emperor made him and his cardinals ride and read on high horse. Now, for those of you who don't speak Middle English, let me translate it for you. Your emperor made him and his cardinals, so the Catholic leaders who wore red, ride in red on high horse. Now, interestingly, that is the oldest recorded reference that we have to this phrase, high horse, which is interesting, comes from one of the reformers. It began to be used then as a way to describe the, uh, the powerful and the untouchable. Uh, those who were above and beyond and bigger than anybody else. But by the 1700s and 1800s, it was actually became, be, began to be used more figuratively for those who claimed to be powerful even when they were not. And so today, if we tell someone to get off your high horse... Uh, we don't say that to people who actually have authority over us, do we? Or we lose our jobs and things like that. We say it to those who don't have that authority but think they do. We say it in order to tell to them, look, stop judging me. Stop looking down on me and acting like you're my boss. You're not. Get off your high horse. Well, in a nutshell, in summary... That's what Paul is telling the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. He's writing to a Corinthian church who had become prideful. And they had made a practice of judging and looking down on other people based on spiritual gifts, based on the way that they spoke, from their imaginary saddles on their imaginary high horses. They had graded people as better or worse based on which ones they liked better, which were more impressive. And they had divided the church like you might divide in your home over whether or not you're a duck or a beaver. I'm aligned with this side. I'm aligned with this side. That's what they had done in the church. But they were also judging who was more faithful as servants in the church. They were judging Paul. They were judging others. And, and, and they were calling into question the faithfulness of these servants as to whether or not they were using the gifts that they should in the right way. They were calling into question their authority to be able to speak to them in certain ways. They were saying that they weren't necessarily faithful, putting themselves in Christ's place as the authority in the church. And Paul's clear message to them in chapter 4 is, get off your high horse. And although he says it with some sarcasm, and we'll see that, he does it seriously. 
He is very serious as a loving father who warns his bratty child of the danger of copying an attitude before an almighty God. And he reminds them of what it looks like to live like Christ. Because from their high horses, they can't see Jesus anymore. They're in the way. They're losing sight. And in his warning to them, I think we have some answers to some questions that we might ask. Like this one, what is our role in judging others? What should we do? What part do we play? What's our role in correcting those, especially those people that we've discipled or those who have come under our wings, the ones that the Lord has placed in our lives? What is our role in correcting them when we begin to see practices and lifestyles that are not appropriate? And how do we do those things as servants of Christ, where he's the authority, and as stewards of the mysteries that he has given to us, the gospel, the truth? How do we do that in a godly way? That's what I'm hoping that we can hit this morning, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. So let's pray, because we're going to need the Holy Spirit to teach us. And so, Holy Spirit, we do ask that you would train us and teach us to follow your word. I pray that you would illuminate your scriptures this morning, that we would uh, only learn what it is you want us to learn, and that as we do, Lord, you would, and this I know is a dangerous prayer, and we do so with fear and trembling, but that you would, would humble us. Humble us not so that we will feel bad about ourselves, but rather humble us so that we will see the greatness of Christ. That we will not lose sight of Jesus, how wonderful you are. And Lord, trusting you, we say, do whatever it takes to make us like Jesus. Lord, that's scary even to say, but we ask that you would do so in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so... Open your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and we're going we're gonna to get to 4, but we want to put it in some context. So Paul wrote to the Corinthian church because they're, they're pridefully choosing their allegiance to certain leaders in the church over others, and, and they're following them in a way that has kept them from following Jesus. Now that's a key point, because they're dividing, as in you might divide over Calvinism and Arminianism, in a way that is keeping them from following Jesus. Okay, that's a significant place. And at the end of chapter 3, uh, he gave this summary, verse 21. Verse 21 of chapter 3. So let no one boast in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apos Apollos or Cephas, that's Peter, or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours, and you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. And so Paul's saying, look, we're just fellow workers with you. You and us, we all belong to Jesus. You're not ours. Stop dividing over us. We are all Jesus's. You need to be identified not with us, but with Jesus, because you belong to him. It's an emphasis he's going to make here. So then here's the question. If they've been following these men, and they've been taking the titles of these men as, their, as the ones that they follow, and then he says, don't do that, the question is then, well, then how do we relate to you, Paul? How do we relate to you when you don't want us to look at you like that? It's kind of like, the, you know, that awkward situation that you had in high school when, uh, when you broke up with your girlfriend or boyfriend because they said, I just want to be friends. And, and you're like, well, then what are we? Right? You can't just be friends. So you have to kind of redefine the relationship. Well, that's what Paul's doing. He's saying, look, don't follow us as our as leaders. Jesus is the one. You belong to him. So he's going to help them define the relationship. And so he answers that, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Look at verse 1. This is how one should regard us, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. And so Paul says, view us as servants and stewards. The word there for servant means any attendant or a helper who puts himself under the authority of another person and does what they tell him to do. A steward means a household manager. And so it's one who has been delegated something and they are to act and to steward whatever has been delegated to them in faithfulness to the one who's, who's given it to them. And so Paul says to the Corinthians, view says, servants, we're under Christ's authority, he's our leader, and stewards or managers who get to care for the gospel that's been given to them. Care for it, send it out, share it with people. And for the rest of the chapter, Paul explains the implications of those two roles. So I think Paul's doing two things in chapter 4. Number one, he's explaining how they should view him and why. 
And number two, he is, if you look at verse 16, he calls them to, he urges them to imitate him in what he's doing. And so he's calling them to imitate him, and in doing so, to bring them off of their high horse. Now, what are they supposed to imitate? Well, the first principle we have, the first principle for imitation is this. As servants and stewards, we humbly save, the ju save judging the heart for God. Humbly save judging the heart for God. Now, don't forget the context. It's really important to understand this. Where we've come to is a church that has chosen their leaders like you would choose the people on your fantasy football team, okay? You like their performance. You like what they do. You choose them because they will benefit you in some way. And so that's okay for sports, but it's not okay for your spiritual leaders, right? And so Paul has already said in chapter 2, verse 3, that he did not come with impressive speech. He said he came with power to change lives, but he didn't come with impressive speech. And somehow these Corinthians have looked at that and looked at his performance, and they've said, nah, Paul, you're not good enough for us. We're going to go to Apollos. Now some will look at Apollos and say, nah, we're going to go to Paul. Then they've chosen based on which is more impressive. So you'll notice after Paul deals with uh, bringing out these titles of servants and stewards in verse 1, in verse 2, he uses that steward word in order to launch into a discussion about judging and evaluating that way. Look at verse 2. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. If you have a New American Standard, it says trustworthy. Verse 3, but with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself, for I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I'm not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. So in verse 2, we, we learn, we get to see what, what it is that's actually being evaluated. What should be examined? And he says it's faithfulness. It's not speech. It's faithfulness or trustworthiness. That's what should be measured. Well, faithful in what? How they steward. And how they fulfill their roles. It's how, how they fulfill the role of being a, a delegated authority to bring the gospel to people, to help them grow. And if you think about it, who's the best one to evaluate whether or not someone's being a good delegate? It's the person who delegated it to them, right? Right? If you give your kids money and you say, go spend it this way, you are delegating the stewardship of that to them. If their friends say, oh, you should spend it over here, is that going to be okay for you? No, because you're the one who has given it to them. Well, that's the case. Now, here's the problem. The Corinthian church is so full of pride that they've made themselves the cross-examining prosecutor and the judge and the jury, and they're giving the verdict as to whether or not these leaders who have been stewards of Christ are being faithful. They're stepping into the wrong place. Paul responds to that in verse 3. Look at there at verse 3. Uh, three times in verses 3 and 4, Paul uses this word judge, which means to examine or to investigate. It's a word that you might use if you were watching a court case and you had the cross-examination taking place. That's what this word is. So Paul says, you know, it doesn't matter if you judge or if you cross-examine me, but note this, or even if I examine myself. I'm not aware of any spiritual problem in my life that would make me unfaithful to what God has called me to do, but that doesn't mean that I'm innocent. I don't know my heart best. God knows my heart best. God is my judge. God examines me, and so you don't get to. Why? Because verse 5, what is being examined, look down there, verse 5, it's the motivations and purposes of the heart, and God knows the depths of my heart, and he loves me the same. God knows the heart even better than I do. And since only God knows the heart, verse 5, you'll notice Paul switches from a word for judge that means to examine, and he uses now a word for pronouncing judgment. It's a word that means to hand down a verdict. And here's what he says in verse 5. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. So we say to the, to the Corinthians, you, you are pridefully judging the hearts of Christ's stewards. 
you are taking his place. You're judging both those who you're following and you're judging those who you've rejected. That is wrong. Stop it. Now chapter 5, you'll notice Paul will clearly pronounce judgment on someone who is in blatant sin. In fact, he'll say, get him out of the church. So that's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about blatant sin that is very obvious where you say, no, the scriptures say this, and that's wrong. That's not what he's talking about here. What he's referring to here is the hidden, unseen, and unknown purposes of the heart. And he's saying, you think that you leaders are doing something, you think you're doing something with these leaders that you have the authority to do, but you do not. God knows the heart. God knows if they're being faithful. And when Jesus comes back on his truly white horse, high horse, he will take care of it. So get off your high horse and knock it off. Why? Because as servants and stewards of Christ, we humbly save judging the heart for God. Because he's only qualified to do that. Now, here's where I'm going to start stepping on toes. Here's where you're not going to like me. Because here's how that applies to life. It means, unless there is a blatant sin that you see, that you can point to, and you say, I know that's wrong because the Bible says that's wrong, you don't get to make a pronouncement or a judgment on a brother or sister in Christ as to why they live out the faith the way that they do. You don't get to be the Holy Spirit for them. You don't get to judge their hearts or their motivations. Or why they, they live it out in one way that is so dramatically different from you, and yet there's no sin. Why they serve in a particular way in the church and not in others. Why they have some convictions that are, not, that are different than yours, that are not sin. You don't get to judge their hearts because you don't know their heart. You don't know their motivations. And judging their heart, whether they're being faithful or not, to what God has put in their stewardship is not up to you. That is way beyond your pay grade. And so if you ever find yourself criticizing someone negatively and saying, after you observe someone in the church doing something, and you say, well, they're just doing that because, as though you know, be careful. Be careful. You are dealing with heart issues. You have overreached your authority. You are trespassing on private land because in the purposes of the heart, verse 4, it is the Lord who judges. There's another implication, and that's this. You have to be careful that you don't become prideful or think that you got it all confidence, you're all great, when you examine yourself. Notice that Paul not only says that the Corinthians shouldn't pronounce judgment, but he also says in verse 3, I don't even judge myself. Paul's saying my conscience is clear, and I think I have everything right before God. I can't, can't think of anything that would make me a bad steward or an unfaithful steward as to what God has, has for me. But I don't know everything that's going on in my heart. I don't know my heart as well as, as Jesus does. He is my judge. I'm going to let him have it. Only Jesus really knows my heart. And so if Martin Luther and Paul and Jiminy Cricket from Pinocchio were all in the room together and they were having a conversation, it might go something like this. Jiminy Cricket would say, like he did to Pinocchio, and always let your conscience be your guide. Okay, that would be what Jiminy Cricket would say. Martin Luther would say, yes, but only if your conscience is captive to the word of God. Because to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. And Paul would say, yes. Follow that conscience as it is captive to the word of God. And examine yourself to see if you're being obedient. But do not become proudful or prideful in what you see in your heart. Because only Jesus truly knows the motivations of your heart. And therefore, humbly approach every situation, not in pride as though you think you know where you are with God, but instead asking Jesus, am I right with you? Am I doing what I'm supposed to? I don't see anything in my life that is wrong, but do you know the motivations of my heart? Jesus, only you are the judge. Humbly submitting to him because ultimately, only Jesus knows the heart. And he will be the judge. So don't be prideful. That's the bottom line. Don't be prideful. 
save, uh, humbly save, judging the heart for God. All right, that's the first principle. Second principle is for imitation. As servants and stewards, we visibly serve with Christ, or serve with Christ-like humility and sacrifice. We visibly serve with Christ-like humility and sacrifice. Now, before we go to where Paul addresses this, where he's teaching this principle, we want to make sure we get on the same page as to what Christ-like humility and sacrifice really looks like. And so to remind us, we go to 1 Peter. So if you want to open your Bibles over to 1 Peter, chapter 2. Peter, who Paul calls Cephas in 1 Corinthians, is writing 1 Peter chapter 2. And this is what he says in verse 21. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. Remember that. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. So 1 Peter brings out the Christ-like part. Here, here we have Jesus, who is God in the flesh. He humbles himself. He sacrifices himself. He suffers. And in doing so, Peter says, he gave us an example that we might follow in his steps. What's the implication? The implication is, if you want to be like Jesus, you will begin to see Christ-like humility and sacrifice in your life, right? That should be what comes out. All right, so let's go back now. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. We see a Corinthian church that is not living like that. They're not humble. They're not Christ-like in their attitude. And instead, they are puffed up. They are gloating. They are proud. And to show them then the dramatic contrast between how they're living and how Christ is, verse 6, look down at verse 6. Paul offers himself and Apollos as an example, as an illustration to help teach them. And in verse 9, he begins to describe how he and the other apostles have visibly displayed the very humility and sacrifice that we saw in 1 Peter chapter 2. He's going to use some of the same words as to what they've gone through here in 1 Corinthians. He says in verse 9, like men sentenced to death. If you can picture the, the scenario of movies you've seen of people that are being ushered to the gladiator arena, Christians who were there to be tortured, that's what he's talking about. Like these men sentenced to death, they're marched through the streets. Like men sentenced to death, they've become a spectacle of the world to angels and to men. A spectacle of what? Of humility, of service to Christ, of sacrifice. And so in verses 10 through 13, he outlines all the ways that they have sacrificed to Christ. Look at verses 10 through 13. We'll just scan it. They've, be, they've been called fools. They've been hungry. They've been persecuted. And while they could demand support as apostles, instead they put their hands to work. They've humbly chosen to work with their hands. They've been like Jesus. They've visibly demonstrated Christ-like humility and sacrifice. And yet, the Corinthians whose lives are in such contrast that don't look like Jesus, have the audacity to judge Paul and to criticize his faithfulness. And they think they're something special. And they boast about their intelligence and their riches and their high position. And they boast in all of that being a contrast to Christ, not like Christ. And from their high horses, they have then lost sight of Jesus. Because they're in the way. Pride is in the way of seeing Jesus. Why? Because they have a warped view of themselves. They have a warped view of who they are. They have the same problem that Florence Foster Jenkins had. Anybody heard of Florence Foster Jenkins? Florence Foster Jenkins was an early 20th century wealthy American socialite who thought she was a great opera singer. She thought she was fantastic. In fact, she had so much money that she was able to reserve places like Carnegie Hall and other places to sing songs. Here's the problem. She had a horrible voice. She couldn't sing. She had, it, it, was, it was so bad that people used to scream and they used to uh, call her names and things like that because it faint. And she thought that they were praising her. <laughs> 
because that's what they were doing for Frank Sinatra at the time. And so she thought she was this fantastic singer. And she was insulated from criticism by her husband who paid off uh, newspaper writers and critiques and things like that, paid them off so that she would never find out. So she thought she was a great opera singer. She was living a delusion. And that's where the Corinthians are. They think that they are spiritually strong and wise and rich and that they don't need Paul in order to grow. They're like, hey, we've got all the benefits of the kingdom. We are satisfied. All these gifts that we have, we have arrived. We don't need Paul. We never needed Paul. But like Florence Foster Jenkins, they are living in a delusion. Paul wants to keep them from living that way and being puffed up. And so in verse 7, he says, who do you think you are? Look down at verse 7. It says, for who sees anything different in you? I don't like that translation. That's hard to understand. NIV says, for who makes you different from anyone else? Who do you think you are? Keep going. What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? And this is where he then begins to have some sarcastic irony that he puts into what he's saying. Verse 8. Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. Without us, you have become kings. And would that you did reign, so that we might share the rule with you. For I think that God has exhibited us as apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. Then he goes on and shares his sufferings and concludes with this statement, verse 13. We have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. So the Corinthians are living like Jesus has already returned. They've already inherited the kingdom. They have all they need. They don't need Paul who actually brought them the gospel in the first place. And Paul, whose body bears the scars of persecution and who has been mocked as a fool by the world who doesn't even think that the gospel is anything good, that it's foolishness, says sarcastically, oh yeah, you Corinthians are clearly better than we are. Because all we've done for Jesus is given our lives to the point of being beaten and tortured for Christ and being called garbage by people. That's all we've done. But you, you are more holy. You are the the ones who are rich. You are the ones who are wise. You're clearly better than us and more qualified to judge us as whether or not we're faithful from your high horse. Now, you might think that that's harsh. You might think that Paul's purpose is to shame them in what he's saying. But he goes on to clearly explain, that's not my purpose. And and it's not his purpose because it goes back to how he views himself in relationship to the Corinthians as a servant and a steward. In his example, we have something else we can imitate. As servants and stewards, final point, we faithfully steward with example and correction. Example and correction. If we were to go back to Acts chapter 18, we would see that Paul had, had planted the Corinthian church on his second missionary journey. And so you can understand why Paul would have a vested interest in this church. And not only that, but he knows that if he wants to be a faithful steward of Christ, he's got to watch out for these people. He, he gave them the gospel, he brought it to them, and he wants to be a faithful steward. And, and he wants to offer them spiritual correction and an example to follow because these are the spiritual children that God birthed through his sharing the gospel with them. And so like a father would do with his children growing up and give them an example and offer them correction, he feels like this is an important thing for him to do with this Corinthian church. And so he doesn't go on this sarcastic rant to shame them, but like, think about a father who would warn his kid not to get into the car of a stranger. He's saying, I'm warning you, because I love you. I don't want you to live this way. Look at verse 14. Look at what he says. I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. Word there for admonish means to warn. So he's warning his children. Verse 15, 
For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. Verse 17. That's why I sent Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. Some are arrogant, as though I were not coming to you. But I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills, and I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love in a spirit of gentleness? See how fatherly he's being to them? How much he cares for them, these Corinthians? He, he's being fatherly because he hasn't given up on his bratty child. He, he hasn't chosen the 21st century option that says, well, we're just going to let them find their way. We're going to let them discover themselves. No, he's saying, you've got to stop this. I'm warning you. You're on a road that leads the wrong way. He's putting up signs and flags and saying, look, you are doing wrong things. There are people who are feeding you a powerless bunch of mush rather than tr truth. And I intend to come in and stick up for you and confront these people. And I'm going to expose them as fools. Like a father would cares for his kids. And then he addresses the Corinthians. But as for you, should I bring the spanking stick? Or are you going to get your act together and humble yourselves and we can sit down and have a hot cup of hot cocoa around the fire? How would you like it? You choose. Why does he care? Because he's a servant of Christ. He's a steward of the gospel and that stewardship means that when he sees those who are his spiritual children who are faltering, even though he can't cause them to follow Christ, and we can't cause people to follow Christ, he must care for them. He must care how they live. And he must insert himself to disciple them through that. Even if that means that he has to say some hard things and some things that would not be easy. You know, Part of Paul's ability to do that, and to do that with any type of reputation that would be listened to, is that he was living a life in Christ that he could say, I urge you to imitate me. And so as we close this morning, that really is the first question that we need to ask for application. Are you living a life that you could say to someone, I urge you to imitate me? Would you say it? Would you be found imitatable as a faithful steward of Christ? I don't know if that's a real word, but you guys get it. Would you be found imitatable? Now, we know that only God truly knows the heart, right? That's what we've been talking about. But do our actions give evidence that we, we can see that God is in a process of molding our hearts to be more like him? So well, I don't know. Here's some questions we can ask to help you evaluate. Do you find yourself increasingly or decreasingly being critical of other people? Judging their heart, their motivations, their purposes. Do you find yourself growing in humility as you respond or think about other people? Or do you find yourself pridefully criticizing people and why they really do what they do? When you don't know and there's no blatant sin there to point to. Are you growing in that? Or are you getting worse in that? Do you find yourself increasingly or decreasing, decreasingly willing to make sacrifices for others? Do, do you start every conversation and every decision with the question, how will I benefit from this? Or do you start with a humble question, how can others benefit from this? Do you find yourself increasingly like that or decreasingly like that? You see, a faithful steward and servant of Christ leaves the, the judging the heart for God and doesn't lead with the question, what do I get out of this? So how are you doing in that? Do you need God to ask you to humble yourself, to help you humble yourself? Maybe what you need to do is do what Paul did. Paul went back and he looked at the life of Jesus and he just imitated it. So maybe what you've got to do is you've got to look back at Jesus, open up your Gospels, read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, see how Jesus lived, and live like him. 
and do what he said. When he says, do not do this, you don't do that as much as you can by the power of the Holy Spirit. And when he says, do this, you say, okay, I guess I'll do that. Obedience. That's how the Lord will begin to work in you a more humble attitude. You just start being like Jesus. But then we've got to call others to do the same. We have to call others who, who God has, and we've got to do it humbly, who God has put in our stewardship. We have to call people to live like Jesus as we look at ourselves and then as we look at others. What that means then is moms and dads, and dads in particular, you've got to start off by living a life that you could say to your kids, I urge you to imitate me as I, as I live like Jesus. You follow me. You've got to do that. That's not a question. If you want to be a faithful steward of Christ, you must do that. But then the second thing is you have to correct your kids. You, you can't just let them go find their own way. That will, Satan would more than, he would love to have you say, I'll just let them find their own way. He'll show them the path. You have got to step in and with a humble attitude and a life that demonstrates an example for them to follow, you must bring that correction. Leaders, teachers, you have to live an, an example, a life. Now, we're all in process, and this doesn't happen overnight, but you've got to grow and be an example of what it looks like to be like Jesus in humility and sacrifice. You've got to look at yourself and, and say, what am I doing in my life that either gives permission for sin or calls people to holiness? And don't, don't live out your freedom in Christ in a way that says, I want to be able to do this, and I'm not going to be willing to sacrifice for anybody. How are you going to live as a model? Look for ways to be humble and sacrificial in how you lead. But see, that's the same thing for every one of us. If you have the gospel, you have been given a stewardship. And so you get the opportunity of seeing the gospel through the power of the Holy Spirit mold you and change you and shape you more into the image of Christ. And then as you see brothers and sisters who are not living that way, to say to them, look, I'm not perfect, and there's a lot of things I got going wrong, but I'll tell you what, the Lord's been working in my heart in this way. And, and I want you to, as I learn and as the Lord changes me, why don't you imitate me in this area as I imitate Jesus? Why don't we both imitate Jesus and call them to that so that they can be faithful stewards of Christ, just like you want to be a faithful steward of Christ. Urging one another to imitate us because we have the gospel. And then finally, do you even want to be faithful steward of Christ. I realize that it's possible that in all of this, there might be some of you who are saying, I don't even care to follow Jesus. I don't even, I don't even know what you're talking about. I'm not interested in this at all. Let me humbly suggest to you that that is pride. It's pride. You think you're better than Jesus. And, and let me just leave you with some words to ponder from 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. We read it already. But I just want you to think about this. If you feel you have no need for Jesus, let me just have you think about this. What do you have that you did not receive? You woke up this morning with oxygen in your lungs that you did not earn. You have a life that you did not create. You have energy to do things that is not dependent on you. It is grace. What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? I would urge you to imitate me. That you would imitate me in this. I've recognized by the power of the Holy Spirit and by His graciousness to me that I am a broken sinner and I have nothing to offer God except, okay, God, I'll trust you. That's all I got. So I would challenge you, wherever you are, that you would fall on his mercy and his grace, give up fighting him, and start following him. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that you are patient with us. We are sinful people. We are those who often battle pride thinking that we're better than others, judging others because they don't do things the way that we think they should. Lord, I ask that you would humble us, that you would help us to see what the grace that you have shown to us, 
we recognize that while we were yet sinners, Christ, you died for us. Not because we earned it, not because we had corrected ourselves or fixed ourselves to get into that situation. It is simply because of your mercy and your grace. Even the faith that we have is a gift. Would you help us to lead with that understanding of ourselves? Not to be deluded. And then to give you the permission, though you don't need it. The acknowledgement that you are our judge. You judge our hearts. You judge our motivations. That we would live like Jesus, being humble and sacrificing our lives for others. And Lord, that as we do that, that you would help us to be faithful as stewards of Christ. That we would make sure that in everything that we do, we are declaring Jesus more than anything else. And that as we do that, Lord, that as we see our brothers and sisters who might be struggling to follow, that you would help us to humbly correct that more people would be faithful stewards of yours. We pray these things knowing that we need the Holy Spirit. So we ask, Holy Spirit, train us, teach us, and lead us from this place to be effective for your kingdom work. pray these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. You are dismissed. Have a wonderful week. Uh, Hopefully you all make it to community groups right after this.